to have Esther Rolf here uh, visiting to give our colloquium meeting today. So Esther's a PhD candidate at uh, California Berkeley. Um, see, she's a member of the Berkeley AI Research Lab. Um, she's received the NSF uh, Graduate Research Fellowship, um, also a Google Fellowship. And her research is in AI and machine learning. And I think especially in bridging uh, between theory and practical impacts. And we're gonna get to hear about that today. So Esther, Great. take it away. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to see you all in person and to know that some of you are on Zoom. I cannot see you on Zoom, though. So if you have a question on there, raise your hand and Bo or Chantel will make sure I get that question. Um, so as Bo said, I am Esther. I'm a PhD candidate in the computer science department at Berkeley. And today I'm really excited to share with you my research on incorporating intent, impact and context toward achieving benefit with machine learning. So I'll start by saying I believe that machine learning really does have the potential to benefit the world by translating vast amounts of data into inferences that help people make more informed decisions. So a, as an example, the United Nations released a report on how big data and machine learning can help contribute to their 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, including, for example, using predicted measures of poverty to target humanitarian assistance to those who need it most, as well as monitoring ecological and environmental change like deforestation by combining machine learning and remote sensing technologies. At the same time though, we see increasing evidence that deployed machine learning systems can exacerbate existing social problems. For example, we've seen AI amplify gender discrimination in resume reading tools, and systems that work well in one context or simulated environment can fail to generalize to new application settings. And unfortunately, these are not isolated incidences. I focus my research agenda on translating this potential I see in learning technologies into a realized benefit. As a statistical machine learning researcher, I see a lot of effort being put into algorithm design and analysis, really important work going on within this gray box. While we have the opportunity to focus on the context in which these algorithms are situated to realize this benefit with machine learning. So in this talk, I'll highlight some of the different ways my work has integrated context in machine learning. Starting with the consequences of data-driven systems, we often think about impact, the ways in which algorithms interact with society, its individuals, and our environment. Perhaps less often do we actually delineate the intent of our learning systems, the scope of our algorithms, including system objectives and use cases. But of course, this is really only one part of this pipeline. In a very general sense, what does an algorithm actually get as context? Well, it's the input data that it learns from during training. So in this talk, I'll also discuss my work on using input data as a way to formalize and mathematicize context in general learning settings. And lastly, when we have an application domain um, where structural knowledge about that space, like properties of our input data sources, we can use this to delineate and optimize for specific intent with structured algorithmic innovations. So this will come in um, at different parts of the ways my research addresses context in machine learning throughout this talk. I'll actually start with a specific application of these themes to combining machine learning and satellite imagery, where structures in that input data will allow us to make algorithmic simplifications with downstream beneficial effects. And applied projects like this one provide an important anchor for the perspective with which I study machine learning systems more generally. In the second part of the talk, I'll focus on real world consequences of algorithmic decision making systems, where I'll show that we can explicitly delineate and design for algorithmic intent as an alternative to say trying to mitigate harm after the fact. 
I'll show that in order to achieve this desired intent, we also need to look back to this first bookend of the learning system. And in the final component of this talk, I'll share my work on using structures in input training data as a way to formalize and mathematicize context in general learning settings. So this is kind of our roadmap, the three sections for today. Uh, and now I'll get right into this first section in harnessing structure in satellite imagery for applications with machine learning. And this part of the talk, we'll see that using structures in satellite imagery actually enable us to make more targeted algorithmic innovations. The result of this is that we'll increase the simplicity of our algorithm with effects toward increasing accessibility across fields as a way of democratizing this type of technology for researchers outside of even computer science. We'll also see that this work can simplify context-aware analyses, and I'll get into what I mean more specifically there, but analyses that will help us to evidence these later two more general parts of my research. Setting the stage here, so as we're talking, there's over 700 satellites orbiting Earth, in aggregate collecting over 90 terabytes of data every day. And combining this imagery with machine learning, I'll abbreviate this as SIML, can help researchers monitor our world across multiple domains. Returning to the sustainable development goals, this type of technology has been used to estimate poverty in places where censuses are sparse as well as to detect and monitor measures of ecological change like deforestation. However, transforming satellite imagery into re relevant statistics like either of these two can be uh, prohibitively costly, both in terms of acquiring, storing, computing on this type of satellite imagery, we're thinking terabytes, and it requires a significant amount of human expertise, both in machine learning and in geospatial analytics. And as a result, any of these solutions like the two on the previous slide end up being very domain specific and can constitute major research enterprises in and of themselves. However, in similar problems, satellite imagery and machine learning problems, it's the same images that summarize information across multiple outcomes. This one image tells us something about tree cover, average income, road length, and many more variables. And it's with this kind of higher level perspective on the problem and the potential for a common set of imagery to carry information across these five tasks and many more that we study in our paper and ones I haven't even thought of yet, that we designed our system mosaics or multitask observation with satellite imagery and I'll explain random kitchen sinks in a minute. Um, but what you see here is this idea that it's the same underlying imagery that gets transformed into a single matrix X or statistical representation of that imagery. And that same matrix X carries information for studying forest cover or predicting population density. And you can see how this will parallelize out across domains. And when we're thinking about the intent of this system, well, part of that is this idea of multitask generalization, but there's also this idea of making this type of technology easier to use for ecologists, for social scientists, people outside of computer science. And there's three main design goals that really pillar this intent. The first being accessibility. So from for a user's perspective, think, for example, a researcher in ecology, this should be simple to use and computationally efficient. So what would an ecologist have to use to make predictions of forest cover with mosaics? Well, presumably they have ground trees labels of forest cover in some location. They can merge those spatially with the rows of this matrix, which each row corresponds to an image, which has some location and space. Uh, after merging, they need to solve a simple linear regression, something that's computable on board a standard laptop, and then use those regression weights to predict uh, variables in new locations where they didn't originally have labels. This accessibility, this transformation of what's necessary to actually make predictions comes alongside a generalizability. It's the same process that a researcher studying population density would use starting from the same feature matrix X. 
And this is all enabled by an algorithmic simplicity. So let me briefly get into what this embedding of the imagery into matrix X actually is. Uh, so mosaics in its current form is built with random convolutional features. This is where the random kitchen sinks and the mosaics acronym is coming in. And uh, for sake of time, I'll kind of explain this briefly as a um, very wide and shallow convolutional neural network. So it's a lot of the same uh, underlying computational mechanics, a convolution, a nonlinearity, an average pool, but it's just one layer and it's very, very wide if we take D or the dimension of this feature vector to be large. If folks have more questions about this, I'm happy to answer them at the end, uh, but we won't really revisit this. So the point that we need here is we're translating n images into n vectors, where each of these is that d-dimensional vector, and d is going to be pretty big. Uh, and then once we have our labels, the actual optimization problem boils down to a least squares linear regression. Everything that I'll show you has a ridge regression penalty. But really, the important thing in this diagram is all of these arrows are pointing toward this optimization problem. And if we contrast this with standard supervised learning with, say, convolutional neural networks, we're not only optimizing over these regression weights, we also have to optimize over everything in the model architecture itself. What this means is we cannot publish this one feature matrix and be done for whatever label vector we would want to put in if a new research comes to us. We have to go all the way back to the imagery. What you will get out of this is a much more complex, a much more expressive method. And so when we're thinking about mosaics, we want to make sure that that simplicity does not come at significant harm to accuracy. So here we compare mosaics to a fully fine-tuned ResNet 18 convolutional neural network that's been retrained for each of these seven diverse prediction tasks. We're comparing on the basis of R squared, so higher is better. And in general, the mosaics performance is a few points behind that of the ResNet 18. When we contextualize this in terms of training time, so each of these green bars takes about two minutes for mosaics on a standard laptop, um, less than a minute on a research workstation, versus about eight hours for each of these blue bars on a pretty hefty Amazon Web Services instance uh, with a GPU. And so these training time comparisons really put in perspective who is going to be able to use this type of technology? How fast can we retrain? How fast can we get an idea of whether this type of technology is even going to be applicable for our problem space? I want to highlight uh, that you don't get this for free um, from any unsupervised method. So here are the orange bars that I've added are using a Similar to Mosaic's unsupervised embedding of the satellite imagery, this is using a pre-trained ResNet uh, that was pre-trained on natural imagery. And kind of training time would be more similar in the ballpark of Mosaic's, uh, but performance here is a lot worse than either of those two. So a little bit of intuition, why is this kind of wide and shallow model behind Mosaic suitable for satellite imagery? Well, one way to explain this is contrasting it with natural imagery, um, a vision domain where kind of deeper convolutional networks have been more successful. So in natural imagery, think anything you can take with like a handheld camera. So both of these are red pandas in the ImageNet data set. And a successful algorithm there needs to be able to tell that both of these are red pandas, even though one is a zoomed out view and one is really an up close facial view of that panda. Satellite images, in contrast, are largely scale and orientation invariant. And these structures in the imagery can help explain why these shallower networks might be competitive with these deeper networks. I want to get into what these predictions actually look like for mosaics. Here you see labels of forest cover across the US US. On the right, you see predictions. And this is just kind of a geospatially uh, shuffled uh, predictions on the horizontal axis and labels on the vertical axis. There's results for population density and per household income. 
And plotting all seven of the main tasks that we study on our paper on one slide, we can start to directly compare performance across these outcomes because we're applying the same methodology. We can also look beyond that, uh, that bar plot of accuracies from the previous slide into the structures and errors and any patterns that might occur there are things that we can actually compensate for later. Where variables are available globally, we predict globally as you see here. And I wanna highlight how this fast retraining time, this two minutes versus eight hours idea actually simplifies context aware analysis. So as an example, a lot of the reason people are really excited about this satellite imagery and machine learning technology is the ability to train a model in one region where you have both satellite imagery and ground truth data, but to actually apply that to a region where you don't know the values of that labeled data. But this is actually a generalization problem, in some sense, an extrapolation problem across space. So to systematically study this problem, in our paper, I split the contiguous up US up into geographically disjoint training and validation sets, like you see in the checkerboards here. And we're gonna systematically vary delta, the width and height of these checkerboards. And as delta increases, the generalization problem is getting harder, right? Because everything in our validation set is essentially farther from something we've seen during training. And in fact, as we move delta from left to right on these plots, you see what this looks like in the US on the bottom here. Performance for forest cover predictions does degrade, um, but it remains fairly stable. If we look across all seven of the main tasks in our paper, we see some tasks performance remains stable in its degradation, but for others, uh, specifically uh, elevation and housing price domains with high spatial correlation, uh, performance can degrade more quickly. From a constructive sense, this tells us there's information in that spatial correlation uh, that we can use to augment our predictions. And in fact, this is something that I've shown has applied more generally to learning settings with structural index variables like metadata, think time or location stamps that aren't actually necessarily viable to use as features in standard machine learning, but can still help us amplify prediction signal. So what's next with mosaics? Well, in the service of actually democratizing or making this technology accessible, uh, we're currently in beta testing mode, and I think we're almost past it, um, with a public API where users can select bounding boxes and get back features for the areas that they want to study. And what I'm really hoping for with a, a, an API like this is that by making these similar predictions more accessible, we can shift some of the research focus at like research ecosystem level away from just deriving predictions in the first place to really understanding their use in a larger context, doing analyses like this checkerboard analysis that we just saw. And this is an endeavor which is increasingly important as these technologies emerge and become more commonplace. And while the use of satellite imagery and machine learning may feel far from home, it's important to note that algorithmic decision-making systems like these of various forms are already implicit components of our lives from lending decisions that get made on algorithmic credit scores to who sees what content or opportunities in social media ads to in some cases, medical diagnostic systems. And as we transition to the second part of the talk, we'll be concerned with making sure these systems are beneficial, at the very least, not harmful. But in fact, we will show that common notions of fairness in machine learning can actually inadvertently harm the groups that they were meant to protect. I'll propose an alternative welfare aware learning framework that directly optimizes for intended benefit. And we'll see that this framework encompasses and extends beyond some of these traditional fairness notions. But we'll start in this section with my work on the delayed impact of fair machine learning, uh, work which won a best paper award at the International Conference of Machine Learning. 
in this part of the talk, we'll think of our model as kind of trained and fixed, and it outputs a score for every individual, a real number, where in general, higher scores will correspond to higher probability of selection in our decision function pi. As a running example, we'll look at credit-based lending, where the model outputs a credit score, things like FICO credit score, and banks will approve applicants for loans with some probability depending on that score. So if the bank's objective is to maximize profit, they're actually making decisions over a distribution of people, a whole population, which induces then a distribution on credit scores in the histogram you see here. Under some uh, mild conditions on these scores, the optimal way for the bank to act is to deploy a threshold classifier. So basically select everyone in this white box, everyone who has a credit score above some certain threshold. When we think about the population as actually made up of different subgroups though, we see that these different subgroups have different distributions on their credit scores. What this means is that any single threshold classifier that a bank could use will give loans to a much larger fraction of the orange applicants than the blue applicants. And in some intuitive, but also in some legal definitions, this can be deemed unfair. So what can we do about this? Well, it's been proposed to enforce statistical uh, fairness criteria like statistical parity constraints um, where, for example, you now see a demographic parity constraint at the top of the slide. So the bank is still maximizing profit, but subject to the constraint uh, that it has to loan to an equal fraction of the applicants from the blue and the orange group. Logistically, what this means is they're going to deploy a different threshold to each score, uh, to each group. So now the threshold score for the blue group has gone down and for the orange group, it will have gone up a little bit. What this picture doesn't show you is what happens after these loaning decisions are made. In general, in our simplified setting, people will either repay their loans or they will default on those loans. And we can think about the probability of repayment or default as um, a function of the credit score itself. So in lowering this threshold, we're actually, or the bank is actually loaning to more people who in probability will um, be more likely to default on their loans. And defaulting on a loan is a bad event for many reasons, but as a measurable effect in this setting, when you recompute credit scores, uh, credit scores of those who defaulted on their loans will go down. And actually credit scores of the blue group on average in this example will go down as a result of applying that statistical parity constraint. This is worse than if we had just done profit maximization purely. This is a type of harm that we characterize and delineate in our paper and we show this can hold and can happen not only for demographic parity but other fairness criteria as well. But I wanna zoom out a little bit and ask what happened here. So the fairness criteria actually harmed the blue group when we considered the impact or the way that these classification decisions affected people. In leading our next line of work, I asked, well, if we have an understanding of how people will be affected by classification decisions, why don't we actually use that directly? So alongside our profit score, here P is what we have in, um, in our credit score, what if we had an estimate of how people will fare as a result of our decisions or a, a predicted welfare for each individual? And we use those two scores jointly uh, to learn our policy pi. I'll note that our team now has expanded to include development economists for whom estimating individual notions of welfare is more commonplace. So we have these two inputs and we actually have two objectives in this space we're hoping to directly optimize for our intended welfare alongside a more traditional expected profit regime. This is what we call a welfare aware objective. And this term eta in the convex combination will be between zero and one as a way to kind of balance the scales between these two objectives. Briefly note, these expectations are um, probably what you would expect. It's the expected true 
welfare and profit of the people we select under our learned policy. And let's get a, into a bit what this objective is doing. So ADA is balancing these scales and ADA close to one is mostly prioritizing welfare, whereas then ADA close to zero is mostly prioritizing profit in this joint objective. And as you see here, these decision rules of who gets selected, people in the, um, and the colored dots here are actually still threshold decisions. It's now a threshold on both scores, or in particular, a convex combination of them with the same term ADA. Uh, in our work, we show that this particular form of policy is Pareto optimal from all that work on learned scores P and W. And I want to take a moment to actually contrast this new regime that we're in with what we had before with um, the, the fairness constrained learning, where now we're allowing that fairness to constraint to hold up to a slack term epsilon. So at first glance, these problems probably look very different in structure. In our paper, we show uh, an interesting correspondence between these two problem settings. In particular, any problem setting you can be on on the left with these distributions on credit scores actually induces a two-dimensional score distribution where the profit scores here are the same as on the left, but there's an induced set of welfare scores that come from uh, the distributions in these groups and the relative sample sizes of those groups. Moreover, there's a connection in that as we increase the amount of slack in that fairness constraint, we're actually decreasing eta, we're decreasing the weight on the welfare portion of this overall objective. And so this correspondence gives us a way to actually think about how some of those fairness constraints from the previous part of this section maybe weren't making sense. Um, it, it generally should hopefully make sense that as we increase the slack in the fairness constraint, we're kind of decreasing our prioritization of welfare in the other objective. But the actual form of these induced welfare scores should give us a little bit of pause. Um, in particular, we talked about maybe as profit scores get lower, we would expect welfare to also get lower, but not necessarily in this big jump way. And there's no uh, particular reason to believe that those scores should be different uh, for the two groups here, denoted by the blue and the orange uh, dots. So this correspondence tells us basically any problem setting on the left can be cast as a problem formulation on the right where we induce those credits, or sorry, those welfare scores. But there's many situations where we might actually have a more interpretable, a more believable notion of welfare scores. And then we can just start with the problem on the right and we have a richer class of solutions to choose from. In particular, in our paper, we look at balancing quality and engagement of content hosted on YouTube. So using data from around 40,000 YouTube videos um, from the paper by Mark Fadul and his collaborators, um, including notions of engagement or the number of views, as well as their predicted quality of score, where, where the predictions are coming from this paper down here. So you see these two scores, our profit score and our welfare score are not necessarily at odds with each other, but they're also not perfectly correlated. And what this means is we can traverse this Pareto frontier between solutions that totally maximize engagement and also try to make sure that the videos that are hosted um, and kind of recommended to people are generally of high quality, not fake news, that kind of thing. This frontier uses the predicted scores from this paper, and they also have the ground truth labels as part of their contribution. And if we had had those, we'd be using um, this gray frontier here. So basically these two frontiers are pretty well aligned. Um, and this should be encouraging, but I'll note that this also is a product of the quality, the accuracy of the predicted scores from this paper that are allowing us to get these close frontiers. And in fact, as our uh, score predictions in either dimension in profit or welfare get noisier, 
that actually changes the empirical frontier that we would be able to traverse with selection policies because we're just going to have to make more mistakes there. Um, so as these scores are getting noisier, we're getting farther from this kind of best in hindsight, perfect knowledge world, uh, this black dashed line. In our paper, we found the performance gap in terms of the errors on those predicted scores. And so what you see on the bottom right is that if we can get more accurate scores for welfare or profit, we can push this frontier up and to the right. So what can we do with this type of analysis and framework that we couldn't necessarily do before? So as a hypothetical scenario, let's say that we're a firm that's primarily interested in profit. So we're, our baseline will be profit maximization at this filled in blue star. Maybe we're willing to give up $400 in the service of philanthropy, basically traverse this curve $400 to the left and up, and we'll reach a solution that has higher welfare utility. Well, if we have that $400 to spend, one option might be going out and using some of that money to collect additional data to retrain these profit and welfare models, hopefully get higher accuracy and push this frontier up into the right. And as long as we don't spend all of our money collecting data, we have some extra money to traverse now this purple frontier. And that might actually get us to a higher welfare solution for the same $400. Now I've run this simulated study to show you that it's an interesting question of how much money should be spent in either of these two phases, data collection or traversing the expanded frontier. And in particular, to be able to run this type of analysis, we need to know how additional data collection efforts are going to change our performances across these multiple tasks. This is gonna lead us into the final technical part of the talk, uh, but I wanna recap what we've seen in this section. So we contrasted intent and impact in machine learning systems. We saw connections between traditional fairness notions and welfare aware optimization. And in that multi-objective framework, we saw that the performance of our whole multi-objective actually depends on the learnability of each of those objectives. What this means is that for reaching this intent for learned prediction systems, we actually need to know how uh, data influence our ability to reach these diverse objectives. So as we go into this third section of the talk, our view of the machine learning pipeline is expanding. We're going all the way back to data sampling and data collection. And we will talk here about how representation in training data influences our performance and learning systems. We talked about this as a way to reach our desired intent, but this is an important problem in its own right, as learning systems that perform well on average can fail to perform well across salient subgroups. So in this third part of the talk, we're back to predicting a single scalar variable for everybody. And our population is made up again of several groups. And we're concerned that if we publish a low error rate in our population, this gray bar on the bottom, that might be more a result of high performance on a large group here, the yellow group, it might be masking bad performance on smaller groups, here the blue and the teal groups. This is a problem that happens in the real world. It's been evidenced quite famously by the gender shade study, which looked at commercial facial recognition uh, software and found large accuracy disparities between intersectional subgroups of people. These accuracy disparities can be in part due to an underrepresentation of those groups in training data. In fact, the paper actionable auditing, which looked at the responses of these companies to the publication of the gender shade study, found that uh, they mostly updated their APIs with data-driven approaches, focusing on data collection and diversification to increase the accuracies for these salient subgroups. So while it's hopefully very intuitive that collecting more data and retraining on these subgroups will increase accuracy for these subgroups. When I saw this line of work, I really wanted to understand how much was this fundamental to kind of increasing subgroup accuracies after an audit had exposed something like this. 
And was this really kind of being hidden by our focus on an average population level met metric from the outset? So in my work on showing the importance of representation, we actually find that this underrepresentation of small groups that we so often see in real training data sets is generally inconsistent with even an average accuracy objective. I'll show that this holds even when we can compensate for imbalances in our training set during the training process. And I'll conclude this section with some constructive results on uh, data collection. As we go into this first question though of how representation uh, kind of aligns with a population level objective, we need a way to actually describe what optimal data allocations would look like for a given learning objective. And I'll build this out using a statistical sampling framework. So our population will model as made up of G groups where gamma G describes the fraction of each group in the total population. This is fixed. This is something that just we hold to be true about the world. Um, we'll model the training data set as a sample uh, calligraphic S, where each point in this sample is drawn from one group specific distribution. And the number of samples from each group is dictated by this uh, vector of allocations alpha. So I think alpha is the data set analog of gamma in the population, but alpha as data set designers, we actually get to choose how many samples come from each group. With this formulation, then we can then incorporate these allocations as part of the learning optimization. So here the function or the predictor at hat that we get out of here, this risk minimization objective is itself actually a function of the training data. So it is a random function um, in some sense parameterized by alpha. Importantly, we're still computing this objective with respect to the fixed target distribution. We're not changing anything about that, but we can change the sampling allocation or generally the parameters of the sample in order to optimize our objective, um, very much in the sense of optimal experiment design, if that's familiar to you. So when we go to asking this question of the correspondence between um, representation from small groups and overall performance, remember this average population performance is in fact an average performance over all of these group performances, where the relative weight in that population average is higher for the bigger groups and smaller for the lower groups. But what we can do in this uh, black box here is model the performance on any one of these groups as a function of the number of samples from that group, n sub g, and the total number of samples n. Uh, we validate this model, we kind of sanity check that it holds across five different data sets that we study in our paper. Um, and you can see we're getting the trends um, pretty well as these um, blue and orange lines fit the empirical data in the scatter plots. We can also use a model like this to derive theoretical results. So in particular, if we allow the sigma g terms and the scaling laws or the parameters governing kind of the importance, the relevance of in-group data, data from group G, when sigma g is equal across groups and we have this symmetric case, then we show that the approximate population risk or average population level performance is actually optimized by an allocation that takes data in the training set, allocates data in the training set at higher than population rate for any group that's smaller than one over the total number of groups. So we have a formal result that under these general symmetric settings, we actually want to oversample in our training data set from those small groups in contrast to what we so often see in practice. So a relevant question, probably a natural question at this point is collecting more data is gonna be expensive. What if we can just deal with the fact that we have an imbalanced or a non-optimal sample from the outset? Well, if we have fixed allocations, we can reweight groups in our training law. So this is kind of a, a general expression for um, 
an empirical loss of the sum over all the data sets, uh, sorry, data points in the evaluation set. But we can reweight those so that uh, points belonging to smaller groups have higher weight, something like this. Um, this general form encompasses things like importance weighting, which would try and kind of compensate for these allocations not matching the population proportions. But it also encompasses um, maybe more surprising objectives like group distributionally robust optimization when those loss functions are convex. So in understanding the joint relationship between allocations and being able to reweight after the fact, we can say formally that if we can actually optimize both at the same time, both these weights and these allocations, then the optimal weights in that setting actually don't depend on the population proportions gamma at all, whereas the allocations will handle that. Uh, but what does this look like kind of with real data? So here, we're running a controlled experiment where we're maintaining class balance or the, the number of y equals zero and y equals one points will remain the same, but we're changing the composition of our fixed training set size, right? So we're going from only vehicles in the training set, so low vehicle loss to only animals in the training set. Um, so low loss on animals, and you see the population uh, accuracy here or population loss, so um, one minus accuracy in the, in the blue lines. And what we see here is that the, where you are in this allocation space really dictates subgroup accuracy, but also population accuracy. If we look at these group aware training objectives um, that have these reweighting properties, like important sampling or group distributionally robust optimization from the previous slide, we see the main thing governing performance in this plot is actually where we are on the x axis, not which of these uh, dashed curves we're on. And what this means is we're getting empirical evidence um, for our, our theoretical results that subgroup representation is important for population level accuracy still. But we can show that this is important now across group aware objectives. All right. So how can we leverage this information to actually improve data collection and process? Uh, so remember we have these scaling laws of subgroup performance as a function of number of points from group G, as well as total number of points. And I showed you that slide where we fit all the parameters and the scaling laws kind of corresponded. Well, we can estimate those scaling law parameters and then we can use those parameters to actually extrapolate out what would performance look like if I had more samples from each group. Uh, and in fact, we run this in a simulation study and we find that the allocations, the optimal allocations that are predicted by this strategy using a small pilot sample and then collecting more data are actually quite close to the optimal in hindsight if we had been able to select um, from all of the data in the simulated study, especially in comparison to these baselines of sampling at gamma or population proportions or sampling 50-50 from each group. And so hopefully this is um, somewhat encouraging in terms of what we can do with a study of data as a form of context and representation, um, numerical representation in particular as our main unit of study. But I want to pause here and just note how data itself is a useful, but it is also a limited notion of context. In particular, studying numerical allocations, as I've done in this section of the talk, will not address issues of misuse of classification or regression systems, nor will it address issues of mismeasurement times when that individual uh, measurement X is not a good enough representation of what's going on in our whole world. Nonetheless, this enables progress toward integrating with diverse system objectives like targeted benefit, weighing off notions of privacy or surveillance burden with additional accuracy gains for um, collecting additional data. And it also gives us a foundation to study more nuanced notions of representation from mathematical and statistical frameworks. This leads us into uh, the first future direction that I'm really excited to pursue in the next several years, 
and frontiers where accuracy, use, and benefit can align in machine learning systems. What this means a little more concretely is extending this data-centric analysis to more sophisticated data collection, annotation, and augmentation strategies, and looping back in with the consequences or the intent of these learning systems, we have the capacity and the um, potential to integrate diverse objective functions like user agency, long-term benefit, and participation. As an example, imagine if you wanted to kind of build a participatory machine learning framework. You might want to ensure that for someone participating with your system, opting into maybe taking a survey every couple of weeks, they're guaranteed that that representation in the training set that gets updated actually confers better accuracy for them and for people that look like them. Looping back in with the first section of the talk in satellite imagery and machine learning and kind of more generally remote sensing in machine learning, there's a wide open door to uh, timely questions surrounding design and use of similar systems to making sure that they are actually achieving their potential benefit in practice. Machine learning with satellite imagery also forms a, an important anchoring point by which to study these first two kind of more blue abstract general themes in the talk. Um, as we saw, systems like mosaics enable us to study the entire predictive pipeline all the way from data sampling design to decision making. For example, in satellite imagery and machine learning problems, very often the training data we're using across space is actually from cluster samples because um, cluster sampling in practice, if you're going to kind of knock on doors door to door, you're paying a lot generally for travel costs. So if you can cluster those samples and generally sample people closer together, you can increase your sample size. So here I've um, sampled kind of simulated three different sampling strategies here. Um, a uniform at random over space, 20 small clusters, or using for large clusters. And I've run this simulation um, predicting housing price, and you can see performance where higher is better here is highest for this uniform at random sample. That's also the most costly sample to deploy for a fixed number of training points. So here we can run this type of analysis and simulation because Mosaics is so fast to retrain. And we can compare the, um, the relative cost of each of these samples with the benefit that we're getting in increased accuracy. And this proof of concept work in the state of Arizona, if you were trying to figure out uh, what that geography is, this evidence is significant potential to expand this uh, sampling based framework to global and more real world settings so that we can understand what types of training data we need to make these similar systems actionable as well as how to collect that data when that's available to us. At the same time, CIML is an emerging technology and as this space evolves, I'm passionate about incorporating my expertise in fairness in machine learning to address the unique issues of responsibility and ethics that arrive in this space. So recapping what we've seen today, we've talked about a project in harnessing structures in remote sensing and machine learning. We've talked about the consequences of these systems, the impact and the intent. And this brought us back to all the way back to the beginning and focusing on data and the input as context for these systems. We talked as well about uh, ongoing and future directions that strengthen and reinforce these threads. And I focused today on four main pieces of uh, my research work, but I'll give you a view of how um, some of my other work rounds out these themes. As well as to underscore that much of this research was inspired and strengthened by interdisciplinary collaborations um, that I've been very fortunate to be a part of and to lead during my PhD at Berkeley, um, where much of this is really a, around building bridges, uh, collaboration, and communication. And this will bring us to kind of the long-term vision, this 10 years plus of really translating this potential into benefit by incorporating context in learning systems. I see a really exciting potential to um, formalize and robustify 
a theory of data as a form of context in machine learning. We saw today recurring structures like spatiotemporal correlations that can help us make more targeted algorithmic innovations. But thinking about the consequences of learning systems, this also gives us a way to delineate system scope and requirements. For example, how many samples do I need from different demographic groups? How many samples do I need from different regions to make sure that my learned predictor is actually working accurately across my population as a whole, not just on average. And lastly, data is a way to strengthen, reinforce, and build a foundation um, for these interdisciplinary collaborations. In particular, I think of data and its characteristics as a way to facilitate precise communication and enable collaboration across disciplines. All right, hopefully that leaves us some time for questions. Thanks everybody for your... Uh... <laughs> So we'd like to try to take questions from Zoom first um, and then in the room. So Zoom, um, you can use the raise hand um, reaction in Zoom, or you can type a question in chat. There's a question in chat. Um, so Kunar, do you want to unmute and ask, or um, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, can extending the frontiers in the welfare versus profit graph welfare model be costly since the cost to do more data collection to achieve better accuracy we can use context-aware techniques to have optimal allocation, but would the data be sufficient? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it goes to kind of the ways in which, uh, let me, the, well, the ways in which kind of these three circles actually interact with each other. And in some senses, data can be a lever that we can pull to move that frontier out and to the right. In some cases, a better modeling approach, something that is more structured, something that goes to this first bullet point in this section could be another way to get more accurate predictions and expand that frontier. Um, so in general, all of these things are very interconnected. Uh, a theme throughout this talk is kind of when can you talk generally about these issues and when can you be very specific about your targeted applications? And you'll notice that the only section of this talk that really went through the entire learning pipeline was the anchored application projects using satellite imagery and machine learning. And that's actually not um, that surprising when we think about studying this entire pipeline, we need something that is kind of tractable enough, um, computable, recomputable enough to study that entire pipeline, which is a big part of why Mosaics as a system is an exciting technology from a research perspective, this ability to simulate different training conditions. We saw also intent and impact. This part of the talk took a very general structure. We were looking at just the score predictions and we didn't actually need to necessitate that those were trained from data at all. That could have been any learning output, or sorry, any algorithmic output. It didn't need to be learned. But when we looked back to learning as a process, we saw that we could control from the data collection perspective what was going on there. And so when we are learning that, there's very interesting interplays there. Um, Thank you so, so much. Short answer, yes. If we can make more targeted modeling innovations, then we can also push the frontier out. Thanks a lot. Um, hi. So, um, when you were talking about satellite modeling, um, I'm kind of curious, how did you relate the social, uh, like uh, the annual income of that area with satellite images? The, wait, sorry, I can barely hear you. The... So um, like you were talking about, when you were talking about satellite images, uh, you also took things like annual income or the poverty of that area. Right. So I was wondering, how did you relate the uh, that with satellite imaging, like how's the terrain and things like that? Right, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So in, um, in the satellite imagery work, you saw seven different prediction variables. Uh, and so some of those were things like ecological variables like um, forest cover. And some of those variables were linked to human condition like average income, housing price. 
uh, things like this. And it's a really interesting question of when you're predicting, say, housing price from space, what are you actually predicting? Because um, a house in a uh, in random house in Colorado might look like random house in California from kind of a bird's eye view, but which of those houses are you going to expect to be uh, more expensive? Thank you. Audience participation here in California, as you would expect. Well done, um, for sure. But the, uh, the idea there is that you are getting some signal from space about uh, what a relative um, cost of a house would be. You can see things like, is the lawn manicured? How big is the building footprint? Is there a pool? Are there trees in a long driveway? All of these things you can see from space, but you're not getting the whole picture. Um, and as a consequence, the R squared for those variables is around like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 um, when we're looking between zero and one. There's a lot of interesting future work to be done in explaining exactly what is driving that 0 0.4, 0 0.5 R squared. So that's significantly better than say random guessing. Um, and kind of the work that would go into that is saying, well, am I predicting mostly like amounts of green or building structures or any of these intermediate variables? Can those actually explain these predictions? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. You're on the speaker side. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to follow up to that. Uh, so would it make sense to look at relative housing prices or that if they do you have like the baseline, the average scenario for the Yes, I think that would also um, make sense. You then get into a question of relative to what, relative to city, relative to county, relative to state, um, which was just one of the questions we didn't want to grapple with in having a straightforward comparison of seven plus tasks. But that's a great point. And if your main point is to, if your main goal is to estimate um, housing price, which you could do for academic reasons or profit reasons, you'd probably want to, to think critically about those spatial structures. You could also imagine, I mean, none of the mosaics work I showed you today actually incorporated latitude and longitude as part of the prediction process. And that's really low hanging fruit for improving those predictions. Yes. I want to add something regarding the testing of price analysis. So let's say that we want to we generalize the data or we change the context um, of it. So we go back after a few years to see, okay, this is what we predicted and this is where we are now. Right. And what how how good we predicted the result of all that. How 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 awesome we predicted. So how do we get right? This is a really interesting question. And um, as we were talking about that that third piece of the talk that looked at representation and training data. We were specifically focusing on training data and assuming that evaluation data wasn't going to be a, a huge issue for us. So it's a very interesting question of how should that evaluation data be allocated and how often, something that will probably depend very much on the task at hand. But as an example, if you wanted to actually measure kind of, if you're trying to estimate average performance of a predictor in time, you'd want to actually um, IID prediction or an IID data set, sorry, I, independent and identically drawn data set um, for your evaluation set. But if you wanted to actually compare performance across subgroups and to be able to detect accuracy differences between those groups, you'd want something that looks much closer to an evaluation set with equal number of samples from each group. So even in the evaluation set design, it's not obvious and it depends on what you're trying to measure over time and what bad events you might be trying to detect and kind of remedy. Great question. Yes. Are we time? One, one more. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on uh, building classifier in the, the health record domain, basically predicting things from Google's electronic health record. Yeah. And in, in that domain, accuracy is almost never what people care about. Right. Sensitivity, specificity, cost of false positives and false negatives, right. that kind of thing. Is that, how does that factor into the analysis you're doing, mostly in terms of accuracy? Right. Um, 
I, I would say these scaling laws that we looked at that were underlying a lot of that analysis, they hold for accuracy. They also hold for other metrics. The exact shape or the parameters there may change. Um, but a lot of that analysis should still hold true, especially if these metrics are kind of decomposable as averages over individuals, which say like area under the ROC curve, for example, is not. Um, but some of these other metrics will be. And I think it's a really interesting question those, when those two uh, blue threads kind of intersected and interwove with each other in future work. That's one of these questions as well. If we have more complex objectives, let's reincorporate what the training data needs to look like in these settings and see if, I mean, maybe the answer is the, the best training data looks the same as if we were optimizing for accuracy, or maybe this exposes something very interesting. Great question. Right. Well, thanks again, Esther. Yeah. If anyone in person has some more questions, uh, I think there's some time now. You can come on down and have conversations. Yeah.